Well, hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Kristen McMahon, and I have the pleasure of serving as the president of the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. We envision a world where the universal principles of equality, fairness, and justice prevail. Today, we are excited to bring to you Professor Richard Overy as our speaker for the Al and Marge Brown Lecture on World War II. The Al and Marge Brown Lecture on World War II was established in 2018 through the generosity of Phil and Marianne Zimmer. Before I officially introduce Professor Overy, a few housekeeping notes. Automated captions are enabled, so if you need those, please turn on that feature on your end to enhance your experience. There will be a Q&A portion at the end of Richard's lecture, but you do not need to wait until then to ask your questions. Feel free to put your questions in the Q&A section as you think of them, and we'll address them once the lecture is complete. And if you have a question but are not able to type it, please raise your hand during the Q&A portion instead, and we'll enable you to, act, to ask your question. And now to officially welcome our guest lecturer, Professor Richard Overy is Honorary Research Professor at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. He has written extensively on world wars and the European dictatorships and has a particular interest in air power history. Among more than 30 books that he has authored or edited, the best known are The Air War, 1939 to 1945, Why the Allies Won, The Dictators, which is the winner of the Wolfson Prize for History in 2004, The Bombing War, Europe 1939 to 1945, which is the winner of a Kundal Award for Historical Literature, and most recently, Blood and Ruins, The Last Imperial War, 1931 to 1945. He won the Samuel Elliott Morrison Award for Military History in 2000 and the James Doolittle Award in 2010 from MIT. He is a fellow of the British Academy, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, and a member of the European Academy for Sciences and Arts. His lecture today is entitled, Filed Away, The Western Powers, Soviet Crimes, and the Nuremberg Trials. Professor, Richard, Professor Overy, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to start by thanking you for inviting me to uh, the center. I'm sorry I can't be at the center in, in person, which I would really enjoyed, um, but uh, I, I'm honored to be asked. Um, today, I'm going to talk about an angle of the Nuremberg trials, which doesn't normally get a great deal of publicity. And I want to start off by explaining the title of my lecture, Filed Away. What was filed away? Well, when I was going through the Jackson archive, now 20 years ago, um, I found a small folder that marked aggression on the outside. Well, that's rather strange. Um, I looked in the file and inside was a translation of the secret protocols to the German Soviet Pact of August 1923, 1939, sorry, dividing Poland between the Soviet Union and Germany. <clears throat> but it was filed away because Robert Jackson agreed uh, rather reluctantly, I think, with the Soviet representatives at Nuremberg that he would not present this in the course of the trial, and he didn't. <clears throat> a second thing that I found in the aggression file was a, a small postcard sized document, which had four little maps on it. Um, and these were designed to inform the American team at Nuremberg about the nature of German aggression. Now, there was the first map in which Germany presented as a wolf, in fact, in these little maps, in which Germany swallowed up Austria. Uh, then a little map in which they swallowed up the Sudetenland. Then a little map to show where they swallowed up Czechoslovakia. And the final map was the wolf swallowing up Poland. But he only swallowed up half of Poland. The other half of Poland was left blank, white. And there were a few arrows across where it said bases for an attack on the USSR. We all know, of course, that white blank bit was occupied by the Red Army when they divided Poland uh, with the German army in September 1939. Now, these two little stories seem to me to raise the question of how was it that the British and Americans and the French too, 
uh, all Western democracies were able to collaborate effectively with the Soviet Union through the preparation and conduct of the Nuremberg trial, because they knew, of course, as Jackson certainly knew, about the secret protocols and what that represented, that the Soviet Union in 1939 had seemed really little better than the Third Reich. I want to start off by putting the whole story into context, really about how the West regarded the Soviet Union before the war uh, began for the Soviet Union in 1941 and during the war itself, because I think this is quite revealing uh, of the problems that the West faced when they were confronted with the Soviet Union and then for the Nuremberg trials in 1945-46. Now, the first thing to remember, I think, is that before 1941, the Western powers largely regarded the Soviet Union as more or less a Nazi ally. Uh, the Non-Aggression Pact, signed in August 1939, and the subsequent treaty in late September 1939, dividing Poland between them and the secret protocols, which of course were not then known, um, su suggested that the Soviet Union was a little better um, than Nazi Germany. And indeed, right up until probably the end of 1940, Britain in particular was very worried that the Soviet Union would reach an agreement with the Germans to divide up the world between them. And in November 1940, the Soviet Union came quite close to agreeing to sign the so-called Three Power Pact, signed between the Axis states in September 1940, which would have become a Four Power Pact confronting Britain all alone. Now, we all know there was a long list, indeed, of Soviet violations during this period between September 1939 and the German invasion in June 1941. It is a long list. First of all, the occupation of Eastern Poland, then war against Finland, deliberate war of aggression. Stalin's intentions with Finland, in fact, were to take over the whole state, turn it into a communist, uh, a communist um, unit of the Soviet Union. But only Finnish resistance present, prevented that from happening. Then the Baltic states. First of all, the Red Army was stationed there as protection. And then in the summer of 1940, the Baltic states were absorbed into the Soviet Union. Bessarabia. Uh, now present-day Moldova and northern Romania, was also coveted by Stalin, and in 1940, he pressured Romania into conceding Bessarabia as well. Like the Germans, the Soviet government had used threats and violence. Uh, like the Germans, they engaged in deportations and murders in the areas which they took over. It's very striking that the World's Fair in New York in 1941, uh, it, the whole the fair was opened uh, with a, a special festival um, marking all those states who'd lost uh, their sovereignty or had been threatened by war. And that included all the states threatened by Germany, but also all the, threat, all the states taken over or threatened by the Soviet Union. And so this, uh, this long cavalcade of Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and so on, marked in the eyes of the Western world uh, a similarity between the aggressions carried out by the Soviet Union and the aggressions carried out by Germany. They were regarded as twin criminal regimes, both in London and in Washington. Now, we all know that in June 1941, that situation changed overnight. With the Barbarossa invasion of the Soviet Union, on June the 22nd, uh, the United States and Britain were suddenly forced to regard the Soviet Union as a potential ally, also attacked by Hitler's Germany, uh, also fighting hard against uh, German aggression, uh, and therefore uh, to be counted among the allies rather than to be counted among the enemies. The Soviet Union used the opportunity, in fact, to try and pressure Britain into agreeing uh, to the frontiers of 1940 uh, that the Soviet Union had taken over uh, in the period after the signing of the pact. 
Um, Britain refused, but a treaty was signed with the Soviet Union on 26th May 1942. And although it didn't specify that the Soviet Union could keep the areas that had taken over in 1939-40, Stalin was pleased with the treaty. It gives us a free hand, he said. Questions of frontiers will be decided by force, as indeed they later were. From December 1941, of course, the United States was forced into collaboration with the Soviet Union as a priority. In fact, for Roosevelt, the survival of the Soviet Union in the face of German attacks was critical because he recognized that Britain and the United States, which are scarcely armed in December 1941, would not be able to cope with uh, a German victory. What's striking about the next three or four years in which the so-called Grand Alliance was formed between the Soviet Union, the United States and Britain is how little the West actually understood about conditions in the Soviet Union or the nature of the Soviet dictatorship. We know all about this now, but we have to imagine that in the course of the Second World War, it was very difficult for them to find out exactly what was going on. The Soviet Union throughout the war and post-war period kept an extremely tight security net around the Soviet Union and what was going on. It maintained a mask of propaganda which talked about peace and human rights and so on and so on, um, while at the same time doing a great deal within the Soviet Union to violate precisely uh, those commitments. Just to take one example, and I think it's probably the, the best known example, in 1943, Stalin agreed that the Chechen people in southern Russia represented a threat to the Soviet war effort. Stalin ordered their mass deportation. And 478,000 Chechens, the entire population, uh, were sent to Siberia and central Russia. One third of them died in the course of the process. Those who could not be moved, the elderly, the ill, many children were simply shot, murdered uh, in the area of Chechnya. This was perhaps the worst of the many crimes that the Soviet regime committed during the course of the Second World War. Uh, but they committed routine war crimes uh, against the German enemy, war crimes which on the whole, I suppose, were perfectly understandable. They also ran a notorious system of concentration camps and practice an extensive terror against their own people. The most difficult thing for the West was the one thing which did come to light, which was the murder of Polish officers in and around the Katyn forest in the spring of 1940. The Germans found the graves and they made a great fuss about it in 1943, uh, trying to claim that the Soviet Union had committed awful crimes uh, the Soviet reaction was to blame the Germans. They set up an independent committee whose report indeed exonerated the Soviet Union and said the Germans had done it. The West remained very skeptical, but they didn't challenge the Soviet Union over the truth of the allegations. Now in 1944, 1945, the Soviet Union reoccupied the areas that had been taken over in 1939 and 1940. At the Yalta conference early in 1945, Roosevelt and Churchill more or less conceded to Stalin his right to take these areas back under Soviet control. But the West really knew very little about what had happened in these areas before 1941 and what was about to happen to them again. They hoped perhaps that some idea of democracy, which they recognized might work in collaboration with the Soviet Union. But the reality was completely different. In the Baltic states, in Eastern Poland, in Bessarabia and Romania, the pattern of deportation, prison camps, the murderers, the murder of the socially alien, as they were called, all of these things took place out of view of the West, which was not allowed to send representatives into these new areas. Even after the end of the war, the Soviet Union continued to do things which the West should have not turned a blind eye to. Uh, 
In June 1945, for example, 16 Polish resistance leaders were put on trial in Moscow, accused of being Nazi collaborators, quite absurd. Uh, but just about as absurd, I think, as Putin's obsession that Zelensky and co are all Nazis, huh? that they were Nazi collaborators and were executed after a short show trial. Even while the preparations were going on for the Nuremberg trials and the eventual uh, tribunal, the Soviet Union opened a large camp in a former German camp in Mühlberg in East Germany where they housed 122,000 Germans accused of being Nazis and fascist collaborators. Of that 122,000, 43,000 died of malnutrition, mistreatment and illness. Now the West did turn a blind eye to this reality. They didn't know a great deal, but they could certainly have surmised more than they chose to do. They wanted to maintain a show of solidarity during that difficult period while they argued about trying Nazi leaders and then finally arguing about what form the trial should take. What became the International Military Tribunal was finally agreed at the founding conference of the United Nations in May 1945 at San Francisco and at the Allied Conference in Potsdam in August 1945, uh, the shape of the IMT, the future IMT, was finally decided. Now, the paradox that I've just been exploring, how do you reconcile Soviet crimes with collaboration with democracy, ran right through the preparations and conduct of the Nuremberg Tribunal. And indeed, it's not difficult to see the early Cold War already taking shape during this period. For the Soviet Union, the International Tribunal was a serious problem. They had completely different expectations. Even though they'd argued strongly in favor of a tribunal, they had completely different expectations of a trial. They expected it to be a kind of super Soviet show trial in which the uh, suspects uh, would be, well, tortured or uh, forced into confession, uh, would then stand in court, uh, the evidence would be heard for a day or so, they would be found guilty, and then, of course, executed. And indeed, that's precisely what they've done with those Polish leaders in June 1945, while the course of the trial was being prepared. The Western powers, and particularly, of course, Robert H. Jackson, H. Jackson himself, wanted due legal process. They wanted to follow Western norms of legal uh, process. Uh, they wanted a fair trial. They wanted the uh, Nazi leaders to be able to call witnesses in their defense and so on and so on. This was completely alien to Soviet jurisprudence and it opened up a persistent gap from then on until the end of the trial between the two sides. There was not much the Soviet Union could do because the Soviet delegation was very poorly prepared. It wasn't how they conducted a trial. The trial was simple. You gathered uh, evidence normally extorted from the, uh, from the victims. You held a, a simple trial. The prosecutor said, you've done this, you've done that. Do you admit it? They admitted it. They would then be uh, sentenced usually to death and the executions carried out. So naturally, the Soviet delegation was poorly prepared. They were not prepared for Western legal process. There were tensions all the time about the nature of the evidence, because the Soviet Union was quite happy with other casual use of evidence. They found witnesses who did not actually act as witnesses at all to the things that they were describing. Worst of all, the Soviet Union had terrific problems with interpretation and translation, partly because a great many Soviet citizens who had the capacity to understand foreign languages had already been sent to the Gulag or shot during the terror, suspected of being cosmopolitans. The lack of Soviet experience astonished the West, particularly Jackson. Um, but they, the lack of experience was evident at every level. They were hopeless at cross-examination. 
The Soviet chief prosecutor, Roman Rodenko, personified, I think, these kinds of difficulties. Rudenko had actually been uh, one of the officials sent uh, to ensure that the NKVD murdered the Polish officers in 1940, because some NKVD officials were squeamish about murdering prisoners of war in cold blood. Rudenko uh, arrived and made them do it. Rudenko was also the chief prosecutor at the Moscow trial of the Polish resistance leaders. So he was a strange choice in many ways to be the Soviet Union's chief prosecutor. And his total inadequacy as uh, a cross-examiner and prosecutor uh, was revealed over and over again in the course of the trial. And once it became clear what kind of trial it was going to be, it was going to be open court, there were going to be witnesses, there were going to be uh, defense lawyers and so on, Soviet leaders were desperate to make sure that a trial did not expose any of the things that they didn't want exposed. The war with Finland, uh, the secret protocols, uh, the behavior of the Soviet state to its own people, etc. They insisted with the British and the Americans that everything should focus simply on German or fascist, as they call them, fascist crimes. And they made a great effort to persuade the British and Americans to accept that argument. Stalin set up um, Andrei Fyshinsky, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister, as head of an indictment commission. And his job was to make sure that the indictment did not contain anything uh, which the Soviet Union could object to. And later on, uh, he became the chief uh, uh, agent between Stalin and the Soviet team at Nuremberg to make sure that the Soviet team didn't make any mistakes and, and allow in court uh, public airing of uh, Soviet, possible Soviet crimes. So in the indictment, Vajinsky succeeded in removing any reference to the secret protocols. He also removed reference to one party state because he said the Soviet Union was a one party state as well. And it might look rather odd blaming the Nazis for having a one party state. So worried were in fact, that when Rudenko finally gave his opening address as a prosecutor, he was told by Stalin and Wyszynski to leave out all mention of the German invasion of Poland in case that raised the question of Soviet invasion from the other side. In the end, Wyszynski succeeded in persuading the British and Americans to draw up a joint list of subjects to avoid in court if it was possible. Now, the trial was the opposite of what the Soviet Union wanted. It was long-winded, uh, even by British and American standards, there was far too much room given to the defense. There were very poor Soviet witnesses, very poor Soviet cross-examination. And worst of all, from the Soviet point of view, at the beginning of the trial, the Barbarossa invasion of the Soviet Union was introduced into the trial by Jackson and the British chief prosecutor, David Maxwell Fife, and not Rodenko and the Soviet prosecution, uh, an insult as far as they saw it, uh, which was never overcome. In the end, as we know, both the secret protocols to the Nazi-Soviet pact and Katyn entered into the record of the trial, not via the British or the Americans. The secret protocols were introduced by Hess's defense lawyer and then introduced in the cross-examination of Joachim Ribbentrop, Hitler's foreign minister. The Soviet Union was lucky because the British and American judges argued that unless there was a, 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 a firm original copy of the secret protocols presented, they were, could not be admitted as evidence. And indeed, no finished copy of the protocols was found either then or since. But the discussion of Katyn was really the Soviet Union's fault. When they drew up the indictment, they insisted on putting Katyn in because they thought it was obvious, obviously a German crime, and they would just be able to expose it in court. But in fact, uh, the Germans were allowed to bring witnesses to make it clear that this was not necessarily a German crime at all. The West could see this. Um, they just managed somehow or other during the course of a discussion of Katyn, 
uh, to put a sufficient lid on it to make sure that Soviet guilt for the Katyn massacres did not immediately come to light. But it was an awkward moment for the Soviets, and they knew that the British and Americans suspected strongly that this was in fact a Soviet crime and not a German. One of the prosecu Soviet prosecution team, Mikhail Kalomov, wrote back to Stalin complaining that the Soviet Union, in his words, was a country of victors. But all the way through the trial, he said, they'd been the object of provocative attacks, not just from the German uh, defendants and their lawyers, but even provocative attacks from the British and American prosecution teams. The final stage, of course, was arguments over sentencing. Now here the Soviet prosecutors felt themselves to be on firmer ground. They wanted everybody, everybody pronounced guilty and everybody executed. Uh, but the British and American and French judges would not have it. Uh, as we all know, uh, a number of the defendants were indeed condemned to death and executed. Uh, but two of them, uh, three of them, sorry, were uh, found not guilty, uh, which horrified Hess von Papen and Schacht, which horrified the Soviet side, while the others, Speer, for example, Albert Speer, for example, Hitler's armaments minister, got lengthy prison sentences, but nothing more. The Soviet side was outraged. They simply couldn't understand, and the Soviet public couldn't understand. They'd been so used to the show trials where everybody was guilty, beforehand when everybody would normally be executed. Here they had to accept uh, the principles of Western justice and they did so with very marked hostility. Now some of the recent historiography uh, on uh, Stalin's dictatorship uh, work, for example, by Robert Galatly on Stalin or recently Sean McMeekin on Stalin's war have tried to show Stalin the great manipulator. Stalin the kind of spider at the center of the web behind everything. But the evidence from the trial shows how ineffective Stalin and his regime could be when faced with these kinds of difficulties. The whole Soviet trial effort was too top down, too inflexible, too reliant on what Stalin or Vyshinsky would say. The Soviet team had very little room for maneuver and they often had to wait days before they could get some kind of uh, decision. In procedural terms, Stalin's conduct of the Nuremberg trials uh, left a great deal to be desired. The one thing that the Soviet side did manage to achieve was no widespread or public airing of all the things the Soviet Union had done before 1941, including the occupation of Poland, the Baltic states, uh, and the war against Finland. The one time the war against Finland was mentioned, the Soviet prosecutor succeeded in shouting down uh, the defense lawyer who was talking about it. I want to come now to the, the third part of my talk. I want to ask the question of why or how did Britain, the United States and France manage to collaborate with a state guilty of almost everything named in the indictment of the German major war criminals. Crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and so on. Well, there's a complicated number of explanations, I think, to this. Uh, the first thing I think is the Soviet contribution to the trial preparations. Um, although Vyshinsky and Stalin and so on uh, misunderstood the nature of what was going on, by chance uh, a, a Soviet legal theorist, Aaron Trenin, uh, had managed to write several books in which he discussed crimes against peace, as he called them, and the Western prosecutors rather liked this uh, this um, term, uh, and they adopted it uh, in the end for the indictment of the Nuremberg Tribunal itself. Training also introduced, also with Vyshinsky, the idea of conspiracy, which became central to Jackson's case against the Germans. Indeed, the first charge was conspiracy uh, to wage aggressive war. Uh, 
And so there was a certain sense in which the Soviets had made quite an important contribution to the international law aspects of the trial, which could not easily, I think, be overlooked. The second factor, I think, is to take into account the purposes of the war. The purpose of the war, of course, was to defeat uh, German imperialism in Europe and Japanese and Italian, but for the Soviet Union, the purpose of the war was to defeat uh, German imperialism in, in Europe. And that was an aim shared with Churchill and Roosevelt. Their priority all along was defeating Hitler without asking awkward questions uh, about Stalin. Not only was that the purpose of the war, there was also widespread discussion in 1944 and 1945 about the possibility of the major states collaborate again after the war into some kind, in some kind of international organization. Uh, in fact, Roosevelt's idea was the four policemen, Britain, the United States, the Soviet Union, and China, uh, helping to discipline the, the world order themselves. And as long as this was uh, still maintained as a possibility, and indeed Stalin thought it might be a possibility, uh, it made no sense at all to rock the boat uh, by falling out openly with the Soviet Union. Not only that, but an open rift between the two sides would have had uh, an extraordinary impact, I think, on public opinion, both in the West and, of course, in the Soviet Union. Unity was important to be maintained even in the months after the final defeat of Germany. There was strong political pressure to present a common narrative of Nazi crimes and uh, strong political pressure and public pressure to make sure uh, that the Nazi war criminals were tried by a common effort of the Grand Alliance. Also, we need to remember, of course, that the Hitler regime was guilty, of course, was guilty of a great many of the things it was charged with. Its behavior in the Soviet Union had been appalling. Um, everything from the massacre of partisans and their alleged helpers to, of course, uh, the mass murder of the Jews. Uh, Hitler's regime was guilty, uh, and I think part of the Western response to the Soviet Union during this period uh, arose from simple respect for Soviet suffering, much of which uh, was uh, actually visibly displayed through film and so on during the course of the Nuremberg trial. The third factor, I think, is that the West on the whole had very poor intelligence on the nature of the Soviet dictatorship and what the Soviet Union was doing uh, in the areas in Europe that it occupied. A great effort was made to block any effort, by the, uh, any attempt by the British or the Americans to come uh, into the occupied areas. Um, and he did all kinds of pretenses were put up to ensure that, that there would be no inqui inquisition uh, about Soviet practices. It was only much later in 1946 that uh, Eisenhower, for example, realized that returning all Soviet citizens to the Soviet Union, which had been going on through 1945, was actually a mistake because it was quite clear that a great many of those returned went straight off to the Gulag uh, or into prison uh, or victimized, or in the case of those returned to uh, Tito's Yugoslavia, were executed. Right? That was the first time, I think, that a, a Western leader put his foot down and said, it's quite clear uh, what's going on in the occupied areas of Eastern Europe, and we need to make a stand on it. Another factor, I think, was the desire, particularly by the British, less, I think, by the Americans, not to display their own dirty washing in court. One of the things that worried the British a lot was discussion of bombing. When this was raised in June 1945 uh, as something to put into the indictment, the, the German bombing of Britain during the Blitz, the Foreign Office immediately said, for heaven's sake, don't put that in, uh, because look what we've done uh, to Germany. That's bound to be raised by uh, the German defence, and there's very little that we can say about it. But the same was true, for example, of British behaviour in India and other parts of the empire during the war. Uh, Many of these things were added to the list agreed with Vyshinsky of things which they didn't want entered into the court record. Finally, and I think this was an important point, 
There was a long-term hope, and Jackson himself, of course, expressed this hope quite often, that the trial would somehow create a new body of international law and a new commitment to international human rights. Uh, and that one of the things collaboration between the three allies would do would to be ensure that, that there was agreement on the establishment after 1945 of just such a body of international law. The United Nations drew up Nuremberg principles, making aggressive war, uh, a war uh, uh, um, an international crime, uh, and the Genocide Convention, to both of which the, the uh, Soviet Union agreed. The one thing the Soviet Union didn't like was the effort to draw up the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, and the Soviet Union didn't subscribe to it when it was first drawn up in 1948. Paczynski told the Western powers when they met in Paris to decide the Declaration of Human Rights, that the Soviet Union was human rights in action, and therefore there was no need for the Soviet Union to sign it. That perhaps encapsulates the kind of parallel universe inhabited in the Soviet Union, just like the parallel universe, I think, inhabited at the moment in Putin's Russia. Indeed, the current war in Ukraine, and I will finish here, the current war in Ukraine is a reminder, I think, of how easy it is to turn history upside down, how easy it is to deny all evidence of crimes, how wide the gap is between Russian propaganda, uh, but, sorry, in Russian propaganda, uh, between the claims and the reality. Interestingly, in Russia today, there are laws, of course, preventing the defamation of history. Once again, it's very difficult to talk about the Nazi Soviet pact. It's very difficult to criticize Stalin. Uh, it's very difficult to talk about the war with Finland and so on and so on. In many ways, in Putin's Russia, I feel that the clock has turned back. We're back to the trial again and the effort not to talk about Russian crimes just as they wanted to avoid talking about Soviet crimes at the time of the Nuremberg trials. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Overy. I am going to invite Greg Peterson, who is of counsel with Phillips Lytle and one of the co-founders of the Jackson Center to kick off the Q&A portion while I curate the questions that have been asked. So Greg, I will turn it over to you for right now. Well, thank you very much, Kristen. And to Professor Overy, uh, when we started the Robert Jackson Center in 2000, a certain book came out yeah. I purchased called uh, Inter Interrogations. And that became a source of a great deal of our work early on. And I am so delighted to be in the screen with you, only wishing I could be with you in person. Uh, the the, the write-up of that particular book on interrogations said, while the trial of Hitler's fallen elite at Nuremberg has been thoroughly documented, the interval between Nazis' capture in May and June of 1945 and the start of the actual trial in late November has until now remained shrouded in the shadow. And acclaimed historian Richard Overy opens a new window. What triggered you to say, aha, buried in those depositions and in interrogations uh, were in fact something that would be of historical significance? Well, it was partly, I think, because, you know, this was an opportunity to see what, what German leaders were themselves saying about what they did and how they justified it, whether they justified it. The trial was a much more formal context. Uh, and, and by that stage, the major German war criminals were much more prepared for what they were going to say. But what I really wanted, I think, was the kind of first impression. You know, how, how did the American and British interrogators when they arrived there, you know, what questions did they ask? You know, what did they know? What could they get the German leaders to, uh, to confess to? Um, it was a mixed bag, of course, but uh, I found that, that all the uh, interrogation material was held in the, still held in the Imperial War Museum, um, and nobody had really gone through it. And much of it is quite routine and rather boring, but uh, there are plenty of nuggets in it. Um, and so I thought I would work my way through it and just talk about the process, also just talk about the process of interrogation, 
Well, difficult thing to thing, do. I'm sorry. One of the things that we found fascinating is some of the people that you actually describe in this book, the, the Ken Hecklers and the Richard Sonnenfelds and our references to Nuremberg prosecutors are individuals who subsequently came to our center. So we have a personal interest and touch with them. So uh, you actually put into context those wads of brittle paper that we have a lot of here. And I just found it as a great tour guide. Tell me, what was the big surprise, the aha moment saying you're, somebody's, you know, you're rifling through that and all of a sudden, whether it's the uh, genocide section where uh, certain folks uh, are, are talking about like Rudolf Hearst and the deposition and the interrogations of him, was, were, were those things that sort of jumped out and said, wow, this is worthy of a book? Yes, I mean, the Hearst one's uh, interesting because, of course, he wasn't on trial. Uh, and indeed, the, the, the interrogations were difficult to uh, to bring, his interrogations were difficult to bring into the trial because it happened after the trial had started. Um, I mean, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a surprise. I mean, he was one of the few people who put his hand up and said, yes, that's what I did. Here it is. Here are the numbers. You know, let's, let's be clear about it. I found, actually, uh, among some of the, the lesser known uh, Nazi leaders, Robert Ly, for example, head of the Labour Front. Uh, and he was very interesting because he, you know, he was, well, he, he was obsessed with not being a criminal. He didn't want to be a criminal. He spent quite a lot of time to explain what anti Semitism had meant in the Third Reich. And I found that quite interesting about, you know, how you could see how they saw themselves, literally saw themselves at war with the Jews. Difficult to imagine because you've got to make a cognitive leap to be able to accept that kind of thing. Uh, but I found his very interesting. Goering, uh, as an air power historian, I found Goering's interrogations quite interesting. But on the whole, the interrogators, the American interrogators in particular, missed a trick. They didn't know what Goering had, all the things Goering had been up to. They didn't know what, quite what questions to ask. And actually, they found him rather entertaining. Uh, and chatting about air power suited them, I think, better than chatting yeah. about the Jews. Professor Overy, we have a couple of questions about Albert Speer. Uh, and so one of the questions is, do you think that he put one over on the West at the trial? And then I think relatedly, how is Speer viewed by historians today? Well, he did put one over. Um, he was very artful during the trial. He realized straight away that he was not like most of the other Nazi leaders. Um, and that if he played played up to the West about being, you know, a technocratic manager whose job was simply to make the war economy work and so on, but somehow that would make, you know, a much more attractive impression on them uh, than if he'd, uh, you know, stuck to his, um, his, his script that he needed forced labor and he used it. Um, so he was, I mean, he was fortunate. Uh, when it came to sentencing, uh, the American judge sided with the Russian judge for execution finally changed his mind at the last minute and Speer got his uh, 20 years. Uh, but, you know, the truth is that if Speer, you know, if the others had, you know, were hanged, uh, Speer should have been hanged too. Um, and, uh, you know, from that point of view, he was very fortunate. Uh, but he did cover his tracks. And historians have spent a lot of time in the last 20 or 30 years trying to uncover those tracks. He was very good at doing it. Um, but they got behind much of uh, Speer's front, if you like, and, you know, everything from his knowledge about the genocide of the Jews and so on, his participation in Jewish policies and so on, his uh, exploitation of slave labor, um, concentration camp labor and so on. I mean, all of these are now well known. And I think if they'd been better known in 1946, he certainly would have hanged. And that leads me to a slightly related question from Kevin. And so his question is, did all four members have to agree on a guilty verdict in order for guilt to be determined? So, for example, you know, for Schacht, uh, the Soviet Union, he thought, had voted guilt, but the other, the other three judges had not. And so just mm. was hoping you could yeah, clarify that to for one. us, too. No, three to one. Just had to be three to one. Um, I mean, the Soviet Union just didn't understand any of this, really. Uh, I think it was, a, you know... Uh, I mean, it was a culture shock for them all the way through the trial about having to conduct trials like this. Uh, and then when it came to the sentencing, um, you know, realizing that, that, that the, allied, the other allied 
judges were not going to find them all guilty and not recommend execution uh, was something that, that they couldn't cope with. So they argued on every single case and they argued a general case, they should all be executed. Then when that didn't work, they argued case by case and so on. Um, but you know, with a three to one vote, there was nothing they could do. And so all of those acquitted and all of those given prison sentences instead of being executed were a three to one vote. Uh, the Soviet uh, judge Dikachenko voted for execution in every case. If I could jump in, I, I just find, uh, in going back to your book for just a brief second, is as a historian, Professor Overy, how unusual this opportunity was at the end of the war in May and June of 1945, that with the arrests principally of, uh, of the Germans and put in what was called the ash can or the dustbin, uh, to have access to such a treasure trove of information, which presumably we, the United States, and trying to understand historically what was going on, but also to prepare evidence for a trial, which was coming up in a very short period of time. This was really unusual. It was unusual, yeah. I mean, it was very difficult too, because the American prosecution team was not well prepared. I mean, knew much less about the history than the British did, for example, but they did the bulk of the interrogating. Um, that was a mistake, I think. They should have allowed more participation from Europeans who knew a bit more about what was going on. So it was a, it was a, it was a learning curve for the uh, American interrogators. Um, I think they all expected to get more perhaps out of interrogation than they finally got. When looking at it, I think it's quite surprising that they got anything at all. I mean, many of the German war criminals could simply have shut up. I mean, it was their right. They didn't have to say anything. It's quite striking, Joachim Ribbentrop, Hitler's foreign minister, pretended semi-amnesia throughout the interrogations. Um, the American prosecutor, John Arman, got really fed up. He said, you know, you keep telling me you, you don't know this, you don't know that, you've forgotten this, you've forgotten that, you know, you've got to own up to something. But actually, Ribbentrop didn't do any of that until he got to the trial itself. Then he opened up um, and talked a lot about things he could remember. Um, so it was, a, it was a, a difficult learning curve. That's why they all liked Goering, because he was happy to talk about anything and to talk at length. As, a, as an acclaimed historian, and, and obviously by definition, inquisitive, if you had been given an opportunity, this is sort of a what if question, to be placed in the prison and saying, who would you like of these you know, 20 uh, prisoners who are gonna be defendants to interview, who would you have selected and what would you have hoped to have achieved from that interview? Well, I mean, I would certainly have chosen Goering, of course. Um, I mean, because of, of all the people who survived and who were there in, in the dock, he was by far the highest place and he was by far the most interesting. Um, and um, uh, and talkative, mm. and he had a lot to say. I mean, if you knew the right questions to ask, you'd probably have found out quite a lot more. I think with that question, I would like to talk to uh, to Goering. Some of the others were pretty unpleasant individuals, and I have a, no desire to sit down with Sackle or Hans Frank and talk to them. One of the uh, interrogators, uh, a British interrogator who was alive for a significant, till fairly recently, and I'm going to butcher the last name, Peter. Kavareski, uh, did you have a chance to meet him at all in your in your in your chances? Uh, uh, no, I didn't. No. no, no. I mean, I did hope I might be able to reach some of the personnel, and I did contact a couple, um, but got very little out of them. I got there was one uh, living in the Isle of Man, I think, um, and uh, you know, he, he said he got material and he was happy to share it with me, and but then he sent me a letter of uh, a week or so later saying no. MI5 had told him he wasn't allowed to talk to anybody about what had gone on. <laughs> I found that quite bizarre, but anyway, so I, I didn't get very far with him. Uh, but I should have made perhaps more of an effort to, to, to do so. But all the chief um, prosecutors and interrogators that I was dealing with were dead, of course, by then. Uh, did, did you find that there was this, within this treasure trove, of, of information, 
one commentator who read your book said, this compilation of evidence of the accused at Nuremberg is an essential description of the humanity of evil. Is that a correct reading? Uh, somebody would walk away from looking at this unusual book that you put together? I don't think so, actually. I mean, it's, you know, the understanding of a Nazi mind is something that's been very popular with uh, academics, trying to think about, you know, what is it? What's the nature of evil and so on? I mean, the, 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 the worrying thing is exactly the thing that was worrying about Eichmann. Eichmann was so ordinary in the uh, defense box in uh, Tel Aviv. And, and um, you know, many of these people were pretty second rate uh, when you when you came up close to them. Um, what it did tell you, I think, was how dictatorship functions. Well, that's a different thing um, from defining these people as evil. No, they didn't have a very secure moral compass, any of them. Mm -hmm. um, but they would not have seen themselves, they would, they would have seen themselves in many cases as respectable, upstanding German citizens, you know, who were doing what needed to be done, would not have seen themselves as, as criminals, certainly would not have seen themselves as evil. Was the USSR, was the Soviet Union able to block issues that would be presented at trial? So to get back to some of the squeamishness that they were having, did all four have to agree on what issues were going to be presented in the indictment? So that would enable the Soviet Union to keep some things out? Yeah, no, they did agree. They did draw up this rough list. And the Western powers agreed rather reluctantly, I think. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the, you know, for them, the priority was trying German crimes, not trying the Soviet Union, of course. Um, and, you know, throughout the, the trial, they made a conscious effort to ensure that they didn't enter things into the trial record or introduce things into their own cross-examinations and so on, which would worry the Soviet Union. But because, they, you know, the West had said we have to have defence lawyers, they had to be able to speak in their own defence, as you can in court, uh, it allowed uh, many of the German leaders arraigned at Nuremberg to talk at length, far too much length, actually, uh, and of course to start talking about things the Soviet Union didn't want. With regard to Hess, a quick question from Phil, wasn't it pretty easy to determine that he might not have been mentally sound? And if so, do you have a thought as to why he was allowed to stand trial? Well, the Soviets insisted he was sane, and they made a huge fuss about it. And they said that, you know, it was the British fault for not putting him on trial in the first place when he arrived there. They couldn't understand why they, why they hadn't done that. Um, and when there was a hint that Hess might not stand trial, the, they were furious and said they would find their own psychiatry experts and so on. But uh, as it turned out, the psychiatrists who examined Hess decided that there was sufficient evidence that he could stand trial for his trial to go ahead. But in fact, I mean, his trial was something of a travesty. I mean, he, you know, lapsed in and out of what what is now called hysteric amnesia, um, and um, you know, his responsibility for the things that the Soviets claimed was was extremely difficult to demonstrate. I think one of the more, more along that line, uh, one of the one of the things we focused in at the Jackson Center was putting together sort of a video format of everything that happened. And, and one of the things that is most compelling and probably gets hit more than anything else is that moment in uh, late, I think it's uh, uh, mid-December where in fact, during the insanity hearing, just specifically on Hess, he's the only one sitting in the dock and all of a sudden suddenly stands up and in perfect articulate German says, I was just faking it. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and blew away everybody, yeah. including the, the yes. defense counsel, Jackson, they simply adjourned right there after he got yes. speaking and the next day they had pronounced him fit for trial yes yes but the psychiatrists who were treating him or studying him said that in fact that was not an unusual reaction and he lapsed back very quickly of course into uh, a state that was not very helpful but, uh, well it played into the russians hand in the sense that he was fit so that's why they yeah, yeah no indeed yeah mm. Uh, I'm, I'm I, having now i uh, haven't read again the book uh, your book is dedicated to alice Tchova and Nicholas Tesh, who I probably just butchered their names, uh, remarkable survivors of an evil age. Were they a friends of yours? They were, yeah. Uh, they were both academics um, and both managed to get out at the last minute from Hitler's Europe before the war broke out. 
Um, their entire families were murdered, of course, in the Holocaust. Um, they went back to Czechoslovakia, confident that there was going to be a communist future. They turned communist because of a hatred of fascism. Uh, and in 1968, they were forced to flee again uh, during the Prague Spring and came back to the UK. And I, that's when I met them in the UK. Uh, so I, I'd known them for 30 years before I wrote the book. But they, they, were, they were very remarkable people who had somehow weathered the storm from east, uh, uh, sorry, from from uh, from fascism and communism, um, and ended up um, living you know, contented lives in the in the UK. A question from Kevin is: Has anyone done a compilation of the items excluded from trial? Is there a list somewhere that that people or historians today can see of what ended up not being in the trial? Not really. Um, I mean, the problem about the trial, of course, is that quite a lot of documents that they needed were not yet available and became available later. For example, the minutes of the Van Zee meeting, um, which uh, Eichmann and Heydrich uh, basically authorized the deportation of the Jews of Europe and so on, that didn't turn up until 1947. So there was, there was a, 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 a lapse. There were other documents too, which didn't turn up until uh, well, either while the trial was going on, so it could then be admitted um, or turned up after the trial. So it's not, I think, so much a question of what was left out deliberately, but what wasn't there in the, in the first place. I mean, since the trial, uh, I mean, there were a lot of documents presented in the trial, but I mean, since the trial, of course, I mean, a huge quantity of documents have come to light, not least documents in the you know, former Soviet zone. Uh, which were closed to Western historians until the 1990s. And if I had the Soviets done their job better, they would have been able to provide, I think, uh, a better range of evidence. But their, their view of evidence of witnesses was naive. They just had no, no experience of it. The evidence was normally gathered together by some prosecutor working for the Interior Ministry, um, meant much of it based on confessions, forced confessions and so on. You'd stitch that together one way or another uh, into a, some, something of a legal fantasy. Uh, and then the people in court owned up to it. Um, and that was it. So the idea that you had to gather evidence which, which would make a case which had to prove X, and you had to provide witnesses that could make that case, was something they never really got their head around. It was certainly a foreign legal concept to them, yes. Yes. Uh, still today, too, I think, probably. Um, well, we don't know, but I mean, I think, you know, the legal order in, the, in, in Russia now today is, I think, different from legal order in the West. Will this play out, you know, you've been reading currently about the sham trials that are currently going on with prisoners of war that are under Russian control. There have already been, I think, a couple of British uh, citizens who were convicted. And now they're, they're talking about a Mariupol you know, trial, kind of a neuro yeah. second trial. Uh, how do you sense that, given all your knowledge on the Nuremberg trial, when they even use the term, they were using a, that Nuremberg trial yeah. to be as a term of art right now yeah. and uh, propaganda? Yeah. Well, I think it's pretty shocking because they're going to abuse <laughs> all the things yeah. which the Nuremberg Tribunal stood for. Uh, and the Euro principles, um, uh, many of which they've now violated by invading Ukraine. Um, so, uh, you know, we're back to show trials again. Um, and there's nothing Putin can say, you know, he likes to say, well, you know, you know, Euro trial, Russia made a, you know, a big contribution, etc. you know, justice was done, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, But justice was not done uh, along Soviet lines. And justice will not be done, I think, along Western lines uh, when these trials open in Russia today. That's what I was talking really about, you know, cycles, historical cycles. Putin is very obsessed with history, interested in Euro trials, uh, keen that you know, the Stalin regime, whether it's Poland or Finland or whatever, uh, is not blamed for anything. Um, keen to play up, as the Soviets were at Nuremberg, the level of sacrifice that the Soviet Union suffered, which was true, of course. And, um, and I feel in some ways he's he's locked into a past that he can't get out, he can't get out of his system. 
I really enjoyed your references early on in your presentation to the uh, the earlier trials in Russia, Kharkov trial and Krasnodar mm -hmm. trial. And I don't think anybody really has paid much attention to even what that was, let alone what you've just mentioned. And it was mentioned today in a first time I'd actually read about it in the uh, Washington Post article. Um, was that, is, is that, do you, do you, have you had a chance to learn a little bit more about those attempts at the propaganda trials? This is a little bit more than the show trials. They were uh, mm. later on. Mm. Uh, well, I would like, I'd like to know more about them. Uh, I mean, for that aspect, I'm quite reliant on an excellent new book by Francine Hirsch, uh, The Soviets in New York Trial. And uh, um, the, the trial of the Polish, um, resistance work, well, the, the resistance leaders, they were basically part of the Polish underground government in Poland, 16 of them. It's shocking. I mean, these were not Nazi collaborators, clearly. They, they were resistance workers. And what's worse is that there were Western journalists allowed into the courtroom uh, to watch what was going on. Yeah. And none of them do, I think, what they should have done, the obvious conclusion that Soviet show trial justice has not changed since before the war. Uh, before the war, of course, there were plenty of people in the West, fellow travellers and so on, who said, oh, well, these not show trials. You know, there really is, you know, a threat to the state or a threat to Stalin and so on and so on. You know. um, but, but most people in the know knew these were show trials. Um, and the, the, the trial of the 16 Poles was a show trial. They were lucky in having a trial, I suppose, because a great many of the home army leaders in Poland, once the Soviets arrived, were shot shot out of hand uh, or sent to the gulag. Uh, Kevin has a question about potentially some ongoing conflict between Hjalmar Schacht and uh, Justice Jackson, uh, since Schacht was rehabilitating his image and, and writing a lot and often fairly critical about Justice Jackson. Was there, did you in your research come across any sort of ongoing conflict between the two of them or some answer and response? Um, not, I mean, not specifically. I mean, Schacht's, uh, Schacht's problem, of course, was his indignation at the fact that he was being counted as a major war criminal at all, because he just didn't see himself in, in that light. Um, and, and so efforts by Jackson to get Schacht as part of the conspiracy, I mean, in some ways, he was closer to being conspiracy than some of the others, because he had, in fact, fueled German rearmament to, you know, deliberately for four or five years. Um, though he didn't know what he was going to be used for. And, um, so I, mean, I think there was bound to be a tension between the two, but I've not found anything behind the scenes, I think, which would, uh, which would strengthen that. Interrogations, it's quoted as, in the book Interrogations is the stark and disturbing history of defeat. It lays bare as never before the human weaknesses that made the Third Reich possible. And un, kind of uncovered or at least brought to light those dusty old uh, interrogations. What was, the, what was the reaction by other historians who, as they're kind of seeing this likewise for the first time, I'm always curious how your colleagues saw something that you uniquely at least brought to public. Well, I mean, it was—I mean, it was quite popular. I think. Uh, I mean, I think for academics, you know, this is uh, you know, the documents I put in the book are a selection. For an academic if he's interested in following this up, he'd have to go back to the archive himself and look at the full arc, the, f the full interrogation, um, because you know I've used a tiny fraction of the material. But you no, know, the view was generally positive. I had one less than positive review from an American historian. I won't name him, but. Uh, who said that it wasn't worth the effort, this unpleasant ragbag of people to write a whole book about them. Um, but since thousands of books have been written in the Third Reich, I think that's a strange criticism. <laughs> I don't know what, what our timing is. I could go on like this. <laughs> I, was, I was just going to wrap us up. So um, thank you to our audience and thank you to you, Professor Overy, for joining us today for our Al and Marge Brown lecture on World War II. And I hope that we have provided our audience with some food for thought and some new reading material as well. And uh, as I mentioned, the Al and Marge Brown lecture on World War II was established in 2018 by Phil and Marianne Zimmer, and it is supported by generous donors to the Jackson Center.
I also want to highlight for our audience uh, a few, a couple of future programs. So on Monday, July 11th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time, it is the 18th annual Robert H. Jackson Lecture on the Supreme Court of the United States at the Chautauqua Institution. This year, our speaker will be Reva Siegel, who is the Nicholas Deb Katzenbach Professor of Law at Yale Law School. Every summer, the Jackson Lecture is a leading expert who discusses that Supreme Court term, the justices, signal decisions, and any related legal developments. You can access this lecture in person at the institution or online through Chautauqua Assembly, and there's more information on our website how to do um, either of those. And also a reminder to tune in for the Jackson Center's monthly virtual programs. This year's theme is Democracy on Trial. And we are exploring the challenges to, pressures on, and opportunities for democracy and democratic institution, both in the United States and around the world. These programs occur on the fourth Thursday of every month at 3 p.m. US Eastern, and they're on our, the Jackson Center's Facebook page. And the recordings of all of this will be available on the Jackson Center's YouTube channel as well. So again, Professor Overy, thank you so very much for being with us today. This thank was very, much. very educational. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.